All right, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a nice lunch. This is uh, Chris Rosoff. I'm part of RHEL, the National Security Applications Program. And today we're going to talk about machine learning applications and hazardous weather prediction. And this will be a session that goes between 1245 and 245. And here's just a quick overview of the timeline again. Uh, we have uh, four talks followed by our breakout group discussions. And uh, we'll start out first with our keynote speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amy McGovern as our keynote speaker for the session, uh, which is machine learning applications and hazard this weather prediction. And just a few words about Amy McGovern. She is the Lloyd G. and Joyce Austin Presidential Professor at the School of Computer Science and School of Meteorology at the University of Oklahoma. And before her time at OU, Professor McGovern earned a bachelor's in math and computer science at Carnegie Mellon University, and subsequently a master's and PhD at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, also in the fields of computer science. Today, McGovern leads a research group that has been leading the way in bringing machine learning and artificial intelligence into the geosciences, and in fact, leads the NSF AI Institute for Researcher research on trustworthy AI in weather, climate, and coastal oceanography. Uh, Professor McGovern has contributed significant research in numerous areas. One of her primary research areas at the moment is in high impact weather. And another noteworthy effort led by Amy is her leadership at the Interaction Discovery Exploration Adaptation Laboratory, which focuses not only on AI, but diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in STEM. So now I will turn over the virtual podium to our keynote speaker, Amy McGovern, who will present to us on an overview of AI ML applications to atmospheric science. Hello, thank you. Uh, it's always entertaining to hear what people say when they come up with a bio and, and just read it from my webpage. So that was, that was fun. Um, I am going to share slides and and tell me if you can see everything in the usual PowerPoint mode of not being able to see everybody. Are we good there? You can see everything? Somebody who has a camera on, stick a thumbs up or something. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Looks good. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, Glenn is the one who invited me to give a talk and asked me to give an overview. So it's a slightly different, told me to talk a little bit about AI2ES, but mostly do an overview. And so that's where we're gonna go. We're gonna see, and I get, you wanna be at like 25 minutes, right? You're going to give me a warning when we get there? Yes. OK. So we're going to start with what's been going on in AI and machine learning for atmospheric sciences. Um, and I gather that uh, some of the same data is going to show up in uh, David's talk, but I think with completely different graphs. So um, what, we were looking for a paper that I'm writing with my postdoc, Randy Chase. We were looking at how much AI and ML has grown over the last few years. and we were kind of shocked to find, I mean, we weren't shocked. We knew that it had grown a lot, but it's growing exponentially. This is um, from Web of Science. He grabbed all of the, uh, the publications that are in meteorology by their classification, which by the way, includes climate papers um, that has AI and machine learning somewhere in the abstract. If you just look in the titles, you don't get necessarily get everything you want. And so we were, okay, this is a, a broad explosion. Now we wanted to look into it a little bit deeper and see you know, how does this compare to just number of papers in general? And how does this compare? We're going to look at the topics and the methods. Um, so in the left-hand side here is just the raw number of papers for AI and machine learning. It's just a repeat of the previous graph. But on top of it, we've also put in the number of papers for just severe weather, just so you can compare. And you can see that for a while, they're going sort of hand in hand. But the last few years, they've really diverged. And if you do this by percentage, what you're seeing in the left-hand graph is just that the number of papers has gone up fine because there are more researchers but the percentages re remained relatively flat. Whereas when AI and machine learning starting in about 2016, the number has just gone through the roof. So we were curious out of all these papers, what are people doing? Are they doing supervised or unsupervised learning? Are they, you know, what are the methods they're doing? So Randy dug deeper into this and broke it out into supervised and unsupervised. And I'm gonna assume that um, I'm not, that, that I was asked to give an overview, but just, just so you know, the definitions for those that supervised means that it has, um, that you have a, a, a provided answer given to you. There's some truth data set. And unsupervised methods tend to be things like clustering or self-organizing maps where there's not really a truth data set given to you. So the unsupervised methods are going up a little bit, but the supervised methods are what are really taking off. So we jumped into the supervised methods a little bit more. 
Um, and here we have a, a look at what m methods are actually being used. And no surprise, by the way, linear regression is still, it has been popular from the beginning. And I, I guess I'm, I'm actually somewhat surprised that linear regression is still the most number of papers, but it is the simplest method that you could come, off, uh, come up with out there by using AI or machine learning. So there it is, it is the most popular. Neural networks and deep learning are the ones that are causing the really big exponential explosion. But if you were attending AMS at all this year and watched any of the AI talks, you wouldn't be surprised by this next line, which is the tree-based methods. There's still a tremendous number of tree-based methods out there. I think chosen because they are uh, still quite easy to understand compared to neural networks. Support vector machines get a little bit of attention, but not a whole lot. In the AI and machine learning world, this graph would look slightly different. Like if you weren't looking just at um, meteorology applications, say, support vector machines were like the hot thing before deep learning. And so there would be this big spike and then going back down. So this was interesting to see. And then um, the very last one is naive base, which doesn't show up very frequently. They're just a handful of things using that. So we decided, well, this could be entertaining. Let's look a little bit more into some of the topics so we can see what's going on. Um, using the one, I'm going to look at the one on the right hand side first. We made a word cloud um, of just the topics that are getting covered by these 13,000 papers from Web of Science. And if you're not too familiar with word clouds, the larger things are show up much more frequently. So apparently, the and we did the word cloud, by the way, just on the titles, not on the abstracts. So they use the abstracts to determine which papers were falling into these categories, but this is just on the titles. And then dropping out all the stop words. And um, we dropped out all the machine learning methods because we didn't want to see the word machine learning showing up in the word cloud. We wanted to just see what the application areas were. So when you break it out that way, what you get is precipitation is clearly the most important thing that people are looking at out of those 13,000 papers. And then climate, because we did tell you that climate was in that uh, meteorology section, rainfall, temperature, I'm not sure what concentration is, um, forecast, circulation, simulation, ozone, all of these, I mean, they, they shouldn't be any surprise. I didn't see any surprises in there anyway, um, but I thought they might give us some insight into what machine learning is being applied to these days. And it seems like precipitation and climate are the two biggest things. Um, we decided to make the same word cloud out of AMS AI this year, just because we thought it would be interesting. Um, one thing I can say out of that is that, of course, there's a lot smaller N, which is why I put my N numbers down there. So the one on the right, the N number is eight, greater than 13,000. There are only, 100, only, only 144 papers. These are the papers that are hosted by AMS AI. I believe there were more if you count in the joint conferences. Um, the data for the, the graph on the left actually came from David Gagne, who was one of the co-chairs. And here, I think they look pretty similar, but there's some other things that are showing up. For, for example, um, we've got wildfires. We've got, you know, forecast is the biggest word, whereas you can find it on this graph on the right, but it's not there. Um, tools, parameters, I don't know what GESRAM is. It's a small N, so it showed up. There must have been a couple of papers on it, but wildfire shows up quite, quite large. Parameterization, a lot of the physics-based things, we're talking about parameterization in their titles. And precipitation, which is the big one over here, shows up much more small here. So I think it's, it's trying to give you an idea of where the, the learning is going. Um, one of the hats that I wear that he didn't read off, <laughs> was it's, um, I, I wear many hats, is that I'm the chief editor for a brand new journal, the AI for, Envir for Earth Systems. Um, this is a new AMS journal. We opened for submissions in mid-November, 2021. Our topics are copied there that's straight from our terms of reference. We actually have a new terms of reference. We just approved one extra new topic area, but it's not, um, it's not going on the web page yet until the, uh, the system allows you to submit to that, um, but it is available. If you are interested in it, I'll tell you about it in a second and then you can, you can follow through. Um, but we, we were focusing a lot on the, the gap that was missing in the, in, the, in the publications was that you could develop, you could in the topical groups in AMS, you could publish about applying AI or machine learning to your, to your area like precipitation, but you couldn't necessarily talk about the development of the method because it wasn't the right audience. So we were trying to bring that AI for science and the development of the methods together, which includes statistics as well. Um, and then of course the application fits into here as well. Um, and then the new topic that we're adding in is we're calling it lessons learned. And so it'll be sort of short things that could include negative results as long as they are well analyzed. We have, um, on, we've had, I wanna, don't wanna say only, we have had 19 submissions since mid-November. This is only February 2nd. I think that's a large number. However, when you're trying to make a word cloud from 19, I'm not sure this is scientifically valid, but it was fun to make. 
so we decided to throw it in there just so you could see if you like the uh, the, the topics. Um, forecast shows up as the biggest thing, data sets. Uh, and by the way, I, when I was allowed to do this, I did seek permission because we don't have actually have a first um, article out yet. It should be, we have two that are under minor revisions right now. So sometime in the next few weeks, we'll have our first articles go up early online review, review release. But don't try to take this word cloud and re-engineer anybody's titles because I'm not allowed to release titles yet. But you can take the word cloud and engineer what we're applying things to. And you can see that we've got climate showing up, validations, forecasts, data sets, lots of things that are happening. Um, there are a couple of, you know, fog, clouds, uh, echoes. I think that was from Bo Echoes, but it broke it into two words. I think I think the applications are pretty consistent over time that they're 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 being applied to a wide variety of applications and just grabbing through being the chief editor, I'm the one who assigns all of them out to their editors. Um, they include crop prediction, severe weather. We've had a fair number of severe weather submissions, tropical cyclones, climate, and more. So since, since Glenn asked also for an overview, I grabbed a couple of papers, very short, um, just three papers in depth, um, not in depth, it's one slide each, but just sort of three recent papers from the literature to talk about. Um, I don't know if you've seen this one. It's still under review in terms of uh, being published. I think, I don't remember where they've submitted it to. I'm actually at some at Google for part time. Um, and I, so I talk to this team regularly, but I don't remember. I think it's going under review in nature, but it's available on archive. So you can grab the, that's where these pictures came from, from the archive paper. It is the MetNet 2 um, paper. They put out a MetNet 1, which was doing precipitation forecasting. This one is a larger scale. Um, uh, precipitation forecasting. They tested it over all of CONUS. And the idea with this, which I think is pretty cool, is that in order to do 12 hour forecasting, so they're trying to, the original MetNet paper was doing like now casting um, precipitation. This one is doing all the way up to 12 hours. In order to do that, they wanted to look at a larger scale context. And so they talked in this graphic on the left about the, the size of the context they're using to do the prediction. So the target is just a 512 by 512 box. And then they have a increasing scale of information that is given to the network. So they give it information in that 512 by 512 box. But they also give it a larger box around it, an even larger and an even larger box. And, and as you get out to the 12 hours, you really need the 248 kilometers. And then there's a graphic um, here showing some of those forecasts that you get. Um, the ground truth is on the top, they're using MRMS and then the predictions on the bottom. And they, they track pretty well. One thing you can see is that they're very um, smooth compared to the reality, but that is pretty much what's gonna happen with a method like this. It's going to end up having to smooth out truth. Next area I wanted to grab when we were doing an overview, because especially because it stood out at AMS to me was wildfires. Um, and I admit that I'm a co-author on one of these, but that's not why it was standing out to me. It just stood out to me that there's that wildfires are a hot, like my pun, it's a hot topic lately for weather. Um, it was even in, for those of you who apply for JETI grants all the time and all the other, you know, NOAA calls, the wildfires were in there as well this year. And so I grabbed a paper on the right that is a review of machine learning applications to wildfire management, science and management. And they had a, a really nice table broken out into all the different types of machine learning and all the different applications for wildfire prediction. So um, the two talks on the left are looking more at fire susceptibility and fire um, fire, fire prediction is several days in advance. I have actually seen some talks from others on doing like fire detection and trying to predict um, where it, a fire is going to spread in real time using what you can see from the satellite data. Um, but I didn't have a chance to find uh, papers of those. I didn't, I've seen talks, I haven't seen their papers. So um, on, on the left, uh, Beth Ernest, who's a PhD student of mine is working on doing predicting um, day one through, she's trying to get all the way out to day eight. The results she presented at AMS were like day one through day three um, for a while, predicting the risk of wildfires across CONUS. And Christina Kumler, who's also in Colorado um, at Cyrus, um, I wanted to say Sierra, she's the other CI, um, to model the fire radiated power. And she used a random forest method and Beth is using a deep learning method. And finally, while I'm grabbing my last, um, paper to go overview of, I more grabbed a topic than a particular paper. I think this is a particular interest and particularly when I've been working with people at NCAR, um, R2O presents a variety of special challenges. And there, the number of papers 
maybe increasing exponentially for machine learning and AI applications, but the number of papers that have actually taken it all the way to operations are very, very small. Um, so I grabbed this one because it titled a research to operations success story. It's something Russ Schumacher has been working on um, and they have machine learning AI based flood prediction working over the CONUS and they talk about how they got their system working. Um, he, uh, Aaron also gave a talk about their um, severe weather forecasting model and I wanted to grab a picture from that and I could not find the recording last night. I don't know why it was not on the AMS website. I probably looked in the wrong spot, but I wanted to bring R2O up because I think it presents really special challenges that are important to all of us. And based on the brainstorming and the titles of the talks in this session, it seemed like it was important to talk about. R2O is often hard to obtain funding for because you have to already have gotten enough funding for the basic research to get to the funding of the operations. And then NSF doesn't want to fund it. NSF says that's NOAA's problem. Well, NOAA only wants to fund it if it fits into their narrow paradigm. The, research at the researchers at universities, I don't know the NCAR reward structure, but I imagine it's, well, you get more reward for R2O, but we don't get rewarded. We get out rewarded for papers, not for producing products, which is, is wrong because if we're interested in taking our work and making it impactful, I think that transitioning to operations is really important. And also it's a very long process. Um, I think that we're starting to get more R2O focus and I think that's good, but be glad to talk about it more. Glenn asked me also to overview what we're doing at the NSFAI Institute. So that was my first half was to talk about that. Second part is to talk about what we're doing at the NSFAI Institute. So. Um, I, we are the NSF AI Institute for Research on Trustworthy AI and Weather, Climate, and Coastal Oceanography. We have all of the partners that are listed here. And since this is a talk to NCAR, I will highlight that NCAR is right down there in the bottom center. I have them sorted by who the partners. So the academic partners are on the right-hand side, NOAA down right in the middle, and NCAR for Federally Funded Research Lab, and then all of our um, private industry partners. And you can follow us on Twitter. You can learn more about us on our website. Um, we are aiming to... to really revolutionize the understanding and prediction of severe weather, high impact weather, and the communication of these hazards. And so I'm gonna jump in and give you a quick overview. And then based on, I'm trying to keep an eye on my time, I can skip some slides, but based on interest, I wanted to give some overview because some of you have probably seen me give this part of the talk and I wanted to talk about some of the things we're actually doing. Um, so we have four fo foci, the foundational research and trustworthy AI machine learning, the use inspired research, and the foundational research and risk communication, and those three work together synergistically. And then the broadening participation and workforce development is also synergistic. And I'll try to talk about all of those in a little bit more detail. The goals we have on the foundational research in trustworthy AI machine learning is to develop explainable and interpretable AI methods that are aligned with environmental science, atmospheric science, meteorological perspectives and priorities. And what, what I mean by that is that generally XAI methods that exist right now are developed for things like ImageNet. And ImageNet isn't what reality is in the physical-based world. We care about space and we care about time. Um, we also, related to that, are developing physically-based AI techniques, which means we're developing AI techniques that are based on the laws of physics. And then third, working on robust techniques. So working on developing techniques that are robust empirically and theoretically with adversarial data. And weather provides its own adversary. Weather provides things, I grabbed a screenshot here, of um, the El Reno um, tornado right before it hit a mezzanine station. It recorded 151 mile an hour gust and then it took the mezzanine station out as you might imagine. If, if you want to look at adversarial data and you were looking at the nice smooth field of that, you as a machine learning model, maybe not as a meteorologist, but as a machine learning model might be inclined to think that that was actually fake data. Now you, it wasn't, it was a tornado hitting the mezzanine station. You need to be robust in that situation, but you also need to be robust in the situation where it really is fake data, where somebody came in and actually changed your data on you and you don't make your model do something crazy in its predictions, especially if people are relying on your predictions. You don't wanna suddenly issue a tornado warning for a county when it was some kid hacking in and messing with the readings. Jumping a little bit more into detail on some of what we've done, um, on the first on the XAI, um, there's a paper that's cited there uh, that is developing benchmarks to evaluate the existing XAI methods before we go developing new ones so that we understand how well they work in environmental science and what it means when you really have a ground truth and you know what the prediction should have told you was important. So they created a simulated data set over the earth and then compare the different XAI methods that exist to see which ones come up with something that is the closest to the ground truth. Um, and another set of another work that we've done in the last year, um, if we were working on developing a guide for environmental scientists to develop their custom loss functions and environment, you know, meteorologists generally have a whole bunch of loss functions that they already use, but those don't exist inside machine learning methods traditionally. 
And so this is just a tutorial, but it's a, a good contribution to the literature out there to be able to use um, the existing skill scores, something like fraction skill score inside the learning methods directly so that you're actually training for what people really care about. Um, another aspect of what we've been looking at is incorporating uncertainty. So it'd be really interesting, this is work from Libby Barnes um, and, and her dad, so that's why it's Barnes and Barnes, um, be able to uh, take the data and say, I don't know, I'm not sure I'm confident about this data and throw it out while you're doing the training and only learn on the data you're confident on. And as you get more and more confident, you may learn on different data sets and doing this for both regression and classification tasks and able to show that this dramatically improves the learning. And uh, finally, uh, for those who are theoretical computer scientists, um, looking at the theory of uh, how we can understand when algorithms are robust um, under small data sets and under different adversarial conditions. I think I still have time to do all of these. So our use inspired research, um, we have five different areas. Um, we're trying to, uh, to work on convective weather. This is joint work. David Gagne is a big part of this team um, working on Developing machine, this is work from, this is just an update, but we're, we're working on uh, tornadoes, wind, hail, lightning, et cetera. The graphic that's shown here is working on a now casting system for um, hail. We're also currently working on a now casting system for tornadoes. So trying to take in both observations and model output and produce a real-time a real-time prediction. Um, we have a graphic over here on the right from some work from a summer student last summer where they were predicting hail um, based on the HER data and able to significantly refine the predictions of the HER. Um, our second area is winter weather here, looking at precipitation, uh, so P-type, winter P-type, is it you know snow, freezing rain, rain, those are the difficult ones, how much snow is gonna fall, what the visibility is. Um, that's another interesting question. The New York State Mesonet, one of our partners through the University at Albany, and the Mesonet has camera pictures every five minutes across the entire state of New York. And we're trying to use those camera pictures to predict visibility. Tropical cyclones is our third, um, in our third application area. And here, the goal of what they're doing is using AI to generate synthetic microwave imagery. So one of the satellites goes over every 15 minutes, one of them goes over twice a day. We'd like to be able to use the one that goes over twice a day to provide ground truth to generate synthetic imagery for the one that's going over every 15 minutes so that you can better understand the rapid intensification of the hurricane. Fourth application area is subseasonal to seasonal prediction, looking at things like extreme rainfall events and how far out in the, in the future can you predict them? And then using that I don't know network that we talked about a couple slides ago to improve those predictions. The next, the final application area is um, coastal oceanography. And here we have ocean and coast and um, looking at predicting fog, coastal fog in the Bay of Corpus Christi, which is one of the largest shipping bays in the United States. And then this one's happening in real time right now while y'all are getting snow and we're someday, I can see out my window, the snow hasn't arrived yet, but it's like a mile away. We're gonna get snow, Texas is gonna get cold. And when it gets cold in the Bay of Corpus Christi, which by the way is way far South Texas, the turtles get cold stunned and they rise up and they can get run over by the ships. And they actually just called for a voluntary stoppage of the ships for this, this cold spell that's coming through because they were about to have a real time stunning and we've been working on predicting. That. And the final application area is looking at oceans. So for example, looking at um, large scale open ocean circulations um, called ocean eddies. They take a few months to appear and disappear and be able to improve our understanding of these ocean eddies, both the, occur the creation of them and the, the dissipation. And then I wanted to make sure I got here in my set of slides. The final application area is our risk communication. And this is really key because here we care in order to develop something that is actually trustworthy, we really care what our users, why they trust it. We wanna understand why they trust it. Trying to understand the key aspects. A lot of people will make statements in papers as an editor, been an editor for WAF for a number of years before I became chief editor for AIES. You know, they'll make statements that just say, well, if I make an XAI method, then people are going to trust it more. Well, is that necessarily true? Does every XAI method help you trust it? What about reproducibility, uncertainty, representation, et cetera? We want to understand how that influences trust in AI. And we understand how those attitudes and perceptions of AI trustworthiness influence the risk perception in the use of AI. We're doing all this um, through our risk communication researchers. We're doing this in conjunction with looking at professional um, decision makers, so primarily forecasters and emergency managers. We're not generally looking at the public right now. Um, although that may be done in future work with our private industry partners. So to give you an example, um, this graphic is from Ryan Sobash, um, and it is looking at 
predicting what kind of storm mode you have. And then they were using that as an example in their interviews. And this particular forecaster said, well, the, the reason that they increased the trust in their guidance is because there was a checks and balances with the human in what was going on. They didn't wanna just trust the AI, but they liked the fact that they had AI plus the human and the checks and balances. And to give a couple other um, examples, this is a question, what do you think about the term trustworthiness? What might it mean in the context of AI and machine learning guidance? And three forecasters, if you're saying trustworthiness of like a certain product, how does it perform on a consistent basis? And how, how could it have improved the forecast specifically in terms of timing, location, and intensity? Or it's predictable in its ways. You know it's not going to work out or you know it's going to work out so you can make any mental adjustments. And then looking at some other questions, what do you think about the term trustworthy? Or when you think about the term that's shown here, what might it mean in the context of the guidance? First forecaster, well, if it's not perfect, that's okay. But knowing how it performs in certain situations and seeing that, getting that kind of baseline for how it performs really increases the trustworthiness. And I, you know, we really like to see that. They're not looking for a perfect model. And that's something that AI scientists are often trying to do, make it a perfect model. They understand it's not perfect. The NWP models are never perfect. They just need to understand when it's working, when it's not working. And looking at the question of explainability, can we boil it down to say, here's the basic conceptual model. We don't wanna overcomplicate the AI to the point where it's not usable. And finally, looking at interpretability, how the data is displayed, again, is critical. I get frustrated when really, really good tools are hard to use for various reasons. It needs to have an intuitive and useful way of displaying the data. And I think those are all really important for our AI. And for the chance of answering questions, I will stop. I have a couple more slides, but I will stop. I just wanna say we have a fabulous um, education and workforce development component as well. I think, am I on time to, 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 to stop and answer questions? Yeah, thank you very much. We have time okay. for uh, uh, quite a few questions or up to four minutes worth of questions. So uh, definitely a very stimulating and broad ranging talk. So I'm sure there's questions. Please raise your hand if you have any. While I wait for questions, I, I could relate to uh, one of your comments about the R2O situation. Another challenge I found is um, if you do uh, actually have the uh, research to transition a R2O product, um, the challenge could also be uh, updating the model regularly. Uh, with yes. If it's a post-processing system, for example. Yeah, especially because when they provide a new product, they don't actually go back and reforecast. And so then you have suddenly a new model that needs to start from scratch. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Glenn, you have a question. Sure. Uh, thanks, Amy. Great talk. I, I did have a, um, a question about a specific area where, where I've seen AI and machine learning kind of growing a bit. And that's in this idea of uh, replacing potentially uh, physical parameterizations within modeling systems. And yes. while it seems great at getting the kind of um, typical mundane scenarios uh, more accurately predicted, it's often these extreme events when we're most excited <laughs> to get something good out of them. And yet they, the training data, of course, on those is extremely uh, limited. So what, what do you see as opportunities there to, to deal with those uh, more extreme scenarios since that's the type of uh, predictions that we're often interested in this group? That's a good question. And, and I don't personally do a lot of the parameterization stuff that actually a lot of that has been work of David Gagne. So I'll throw the parameterization part to him, but I will answer the extreme part with a slightly different answer that isn't parameterization. Um, and that is uh, one of the works um, that, I did, that I've done recently um, is actually something I'm doing at my time at Google. We're looking at predicting extreme heat because you don't really care about the temperature forecast when it's not extreme. I mean, you care, right? You wanna get it right, but you care, you care deeply when it's an extreme heat or an extreme cold event. And we've been playing with the way that we need to train the model to do these events. And we're trying to predict it up to a, a month in advance. And what's really interesting is if you do your traditional loss function, you overall get a better score for evaluation because you're predicting 99% of the time. But we ended up doing an exponentiated loss function where we made it really, really penalized for the extreme events. And although it makes us a little bit poorer on the sort of general weather days, we're getting much better results on the extreme heat events. And we're getting them all the way out to 28 days. So I think that shows an interesting set of results that you really have to play with. I mean, like you said, there's not a lot of extreme heat events, right? I mean, there's more and more, but there's not enough compared to everyday events. And so we had to really exponentially penalize the model for getting those wrong in order to get something good, but we have a nice model. Does that answer part of the question? Okay. 
We have time for one more question. We have Morris Weissman. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, following along Glenn's question about extreme events, um, one aspect of extreme events, at least in the convective world, is it's highly localized as well yes. as extreme. That would seem to be an additional um, challenge, I would, I would think. I would agree. It is definitely a challenge. Um, we actually were talking about that with the, with the extreme event, although with tornadoes for a long time, we've been working on tornadoes and they're super highly local, of course, um, and hail. But with the um, with the heat, we've been working on that as well, because the heat predictions we're doing are at two degrees. But I don't mean two degrees of heat. I mean, two degrees of longitude, latitude. And so it's right. yeah. very widely spaced when, of course, the heat events might be very highly local. Um, it it's a challenge and it's one that you have to play with your machine learning right now. There isn't like a method out of the box that just hands it to you, right? You have to undersample, you have to oversample, you have to penalize it. Um, and you have to create a lot of synthetic data, particularly for things like tornadoes. There just aren't enough of them. Not that I'm wishing extra, please. My, my roof does not need more. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for that talk. Uh, we will move on now to our next talk by David John Gagne, who will speak to us about machine learning for predicting and understanding high impact weather. Thank you, Chris. Uh, let me go ahead and share a screen here. And I assume everyone can see, see my slides. All right. Yes. All right. Uh, first, uh, thank you, Amy, for the great I think, uh, overview talk. I think that this helped motivate this pretty well. What I'm going to try to do is dive in a little bit deeper on on a couple of different uh, machine learning high impact weather applications and kind of talk about some of the things, the exciting things we found, also some of the some of the ongoing challenges uh, and where we want to go from there. So the first thing I want to highlight is how some severe weather machine learning applications across different time scales, uh, as a Amy showed in her in her talk, that the number of uh, Machine learning application papers has has exploded in the past five years. Uh, so so now there are a lot of different groups kind of taking different approaches to like high impact weather and climate and other kinds of prediction problems uh, using different data sets, time scales, and methods. Uh, so to highlight a few examples, uh, out of uh, CSU with uh, Aaron Hill and Russ Schumacher's group, they've been working on a uh, kind of extended range, uh, severe weather forecast, uh, forecast that's kind of mimicking the SPC guidance. So this is an example for the the, the December, the Mayfield tornado outbreak. Uh, shows a day three general probability of severe, but kind of highlighting the, if not exactly the right threat area, kind of pretty darn close to, to the areas that were, that were heavily affected that day. Uh, this uses uh, random forest and, uh, the global ensemble forecast system uh, as, as input. Uh, a, a student, a gra recently graduated grad student I've been working with, Kyle Shaw, has also been working on using a combination of analog ensemble and uh, UNET to, to come up with a, a better uh, precipitation uh, uh, kind of bias correction and uh, spatial uh, smoothing approach uh, that kind of results in more coherent uh, precipitation uh, forecasts uh, and, and better calibrated. Uh, as we get kind of shorter in time, there's been a lot of work on kind of uh, convective lying ensembles and uh, severe hazards, including hail, which is what I've been working on the past few years. Uh, uh, but other groups have been applying it to other topics like tornadoes. So Ryan Sobash, which I assume you'll probably talk about in his talk, it has been working on a multi-hazard uh, neural network uh, severe weather prediction system that uh, has a really great uh, visual interface for it. Uh, there's even been some some work within, like we talk about research operations. Some of the operations people have been conducting their own research to build new their own uh, machine learning forecast system. So this is from uh, Brothers and Hammer at the NWS Cheyenne office. They've trained a, a random forest to, to basically predict high wind events in Wyoming. Uh, and it seems to be doing pretty well. So this is from their AMS poster. So kind of, and they're actually running it in, in real time in their, in their office. Uh, kind of also looking at this kind of one to 12 hour period, the DeepMind team has been, they recently had a paper come out on, on their uh, 
uh, generative adversarial network-based uh, precipitation outcasting system. Uh, that was pretty notable for being able to like produce realistic looking precipitation structures and advect them properly over, over time. Uh, so, so they were able to improve on kind of smoother existing approaches as well as kind of image, uh, image processing based uh, advection. Uh, then when we get into the kind of the warning time frame, there's even more work going on here. So uh, Ryan Lagerquist put together a, a deep learning model for predicting tornado probabilities from, from radar data. Uh, there's also, uh, Taya Sandmail has also been working on uh, another tornado probability product, uh, uh, FeeTor. This one uses a random forest, but it's also been tested in kind of quasi real time settings. Uh, so, so kind of some, uh, you see there's a lot of different data sets being used, uh, quite a few different algorithms, and they're all, all of them are showing promising results in different ways. Uh, to kind of talk about some of these algorithms in a little more detail, uh, a lot of approaches are using random forest, which is an ensemble of randomized decision trees. Basically, you take your original data, you feed it through uh, into, uh, resample it, feed it into ensemble decision trees. Uh, and then average the predictions from each tree. Uh, you get a robust uh, prediction model that's pretty easily easy to tune and apply on lots of different problems. So it's gotten a lot of wide usage because of that. Uh, more recently, there's been a lot of excitement about deep learning uh, in the atmospheric sciences. A lot of this is driven by what are called convolutional neural networks. Uh, and these are neural networks that can learn spatial features. So in this case, we take a radar image and we can break it down into different components uh, and then scale and, and uh, combine these components to identify significant features in the radar image that may lead to hail or tornado or, or any other kind of hazard. Uh, so, since uh, convolutional neural networks have been popular, a particular flavor of them called UNETs has gotten a, a whole lot of attention because uh, they can do automatic image to image translation with multi-scale features. So, so the idea is you take like a radar image uh, or, or, or model output, you feed it through the, the the UNET and it learns filters at different scales that it can then send multi-scale signals through the network and recombine them to come up with like fairly high resolution images that, that reflect the original image, but like look at all kinds of different features. Uh, and there's different flavors of these that, that have been tested and are, and are available out there. And these are being applied to all kinds of problems now. Um, so to kind of dive in on, on, on a couple of these uh, algorithms, how they're being used. Uh, first, I want to talk about some machine learning hail prediction inner comparison. Uh, this is uh, work with Amanda Burke, Nathan Snook, Amy McGovern, and Eric Loken. Uh, the, one of the questions we had was, uh, since a number of us are working on applying these kinds of hail machine learning systems in, in, in quasi real time through the hazardous weather testbed, we're wondering how much our different algorithmic choices are, are are impacting the resulting predictions and how, how, how much variance in the, in the scoring are we getting. Um, so we all trained on the same model, the, the NOAA HREF V3 uh, convection aligning ensemble uh, and tested our, our models over the HWT in 2021. So this is like May through June uh, time period. Uh, there's three different approaches that we were testing directly. So one is the uh, called the Burke Random Forest where we, it's a storm-based algorithm. So you extract the storms from the convection line model, uh, pull out a bunch of attributes about these storms and then calculate your hail probabilities on each storm, but then aggregate them uh, with a neighborhood smoother at the end. Uh, the the local random forest on the other hand is applied at every like, I think coarse grid cell across the CONUS uh, and the, uses a basically smooth input feature. So they take the average ensemble mean cape and uh, kind of a smooth UH field and uh, things like that. And then feed that through the random forest, but don't do any smoothing at the end. So we just see the output of the random forest directly as the, as the probability. And then we also have a, a unit approach also developed by Burke that basically applies a unit to each member and then smooths and calibrates from there. Uh, so, so this one doesn't do as much initial processing. It just kind of takes the fields and uh, get, gives us a, a resulting hail probability. Um, first, I want to show a couple of cases where one, first where they perform really well. Uh, so, so this is a uh, May 8th, 2022, where it's a, uh, the black dots are hail reports. Uh, we had a bunch in Kansas and then uh, another collection in, in Southwest Missouri. Uh, the Loken algorithm 
uh, basically covers I think the entire threat area. All the hail reports have non-zero probabilities, uh, but it also tends to have a lot of called false alarm areas, so high probabilities where there aren't any hail occurring. Uh, the unit and the random forest, on the other hand, are, are a bit more constrained in their probabilities. Uh, the ra random forest uh, seems to key in on the the main hail region better, but does miss some of the, the southwest hail, uh, southwest Missouri hail hail reports. Um, Whereas the, the, I think the Burke Hale method, there the UNET captures it a little better, um, and but both of these have a, like less false alarm area than than Loken. On the other hand, we can pick a more marginal day uh, where there the only reports were or two hail reports in in Maryland that were that were like kind of one inch hail. Uh, the Loken method captured these hail reports and kind of highlighted the area where storms were present, but then also had basically picked out a lot of areas where there were not any hail that occurred. The both the Burke unit and RF uh, random forest methods uh, didn't miss the, these reports, um, and, whereas the the SPC was able to to correctly get those and and I think did the best out, out of the bunch on on this particular day. Um, but like some of the algorithmic choices, where like this one is very much keyed in on more intense storms, there weren't as many intense storms on this day, so so these algorithms didn't kind of didn't pick up on those areas. Uh, whereas the Loken method, I think, uh, doesn't like do any initial filtering, uh, so so it highlights a much broader area, but it's more likely to capture all the storms. Uh, it's also likely to pick up on areas where there is favorable environment for hail, but it may not be uh, uh, any storms in the model. So overall verification, what, what does this look like? Uh, in terms of reliability, uh, most of the algorithms are fairly reliable in the, uh, for, for the kind of the zero to 30% probability range. Uh, there's more variation at higher probability. So like lo the Loken method tends to be, be underconfident, uh, whereas the, the UNET is uh, kind of overconfident uh, at higher probabilities. Uh, the, the Burke random force method is fairly competent across all probabilities, but is less sharp than, than the other methods. And the SBC is also, they're also quite reliable in general, although they're underconfident. So a little bit overly, maybe overly conservative at really high probabilities. In terms of discrimination, the Loken random forest method is the best at capturing as many hail reports as possible uh, and show some additional skill over uh, the other methods, including the uh, SBC at like picking up on uh, more hail events while also not having too many false alarms. So, so this is uh, kind of initial dive in the overall verification. We're planning to dig deeper and understand some of the uh, other factors going on here. Uh, another project we're working on uh, is a storm morphology diagnosis. So trying to determine if a storm is a supercell or a squall line or a pulse storm. Uh, we're interested in this because uh, the the storm morphology has a big impact on what kind of hazards the storm will produce. So a supercell is more likely to produce tornadoes and hail. A bow echo is more likely to produce strong winds, and pole storms are likely to produce neither. So uh, you can uh, a forecaster can look at a radar image or a single model and, and discriminate this pretty pretty easily. But when we're giving them an ensemble of models and we want to keep growing our ensembles and add more resolution, it's going to be take longer and longer to actually go through the process of trying to analyze storm mode to the point where forecaster can't doesn't have time to do that. So if we can use machine learning to aid the forecaster in identifying storm mode and producing derived products like an neighborhood probability of supercell, uh, then the forecaster could look at could basically see the timing of when supercells might occur versus score lines and that can help them adjust their own probabilities of tornadoes. So we're not telling the forecaster directly when the hazard will be, but we're providing them con contextual information that can help them make a better determination of that. Um, also with this, we want to test out two, a couple different machine learning methods for doing this, as well as seeing if we can find a way to reduce the hand labeling burden of labeling storm morphology. Uh, so our input data for this is uh, we, we have a 500, like I guess 700-ish wharf runs from uh, the uh, basically a three kilometer Conus Wharf data set that uh, Ryan Sebastian company generated. Uh, we extract a bunch of storm objects uh, from, from the model. So we have like kind of different classes of storms. These are all like kind of different linear systems. Uh, and we had uh, a subset of these labeled, but hand labeled by experts. Uh, but this process is uh, extremely time consuming and there's not always agreement and, co and different confidences in, in these labels. Uh, 
So, so we also looked at other approaches that don't require hand labeling every single storm. Uh, with the hand labels, we were able to train a supervised convolutional neural network to identify to estimate the different kinds of storm modes. Uh, in this case, we use a three-class system: supercell, QLCS, and disorganized. Uh, we then uh, also have a semi-supervised approach where we take this latent space uh, from the model. Uh, so, so basically, this is just the internal output of one of the layers. Uh, we feed it into a Gaussian mixture model and kind of group, uh, make clusters out of the out of the latent space. And from these clusters, we can then say that like one cluster, say, looks more like a QLCS. One cluster looks more like, oh, these are all like disorganized storms. And then one cluster looks more like supercells. So we'll label it, label it as supercells. And there's about 20 different clusters uh, that, that we do this to. And from that, since the, Q, the GMM gives you a probability associated with each cluster for every point, we can then get a probability of each storm, storm mode from that. Uh, so how, how do they compare? Well, we can do a climatological comparison and, and see with the supervised method, uh, supercells are primarily over the southern plains, uh, uh, whereas the QLCSs are, are, are generally further east and the disorganized you tend to see over the southeast. Uh, we can also look at the diurnal evolution. Uh, we can see, see the disorganized tends to peak in the middle of the day, supercell a little later, and uh, QLCS tends to be even later than that. Uh, we see similar trends in the semi-supervised data, although there's a little bit more overlap between the supercell and QLCS. Uh, we can also look at the conditional probability of different hazards. Uh, so with supercells, we see that tornadoes are much more likely over QLCS and disorganized, and hail is much more likely, uh, but wind is more likely with QLCS. Uh, we see some of that separation with semi-supervised, uh, but not, not as much, especially in the case of tornado. Uh, so there's still more digging, but we're planning to test this out again in the HWT uh, this coming year and, and get more forecaster feedback on it. Uh, some challenges and next steps I wanted to highlight before the end. Uh, some of the issues we're running into, one is quality and biases in our ground truth. Uh, for all the severe weather stuff, we rely on severe weather reports, which have all kinds of population and collection biases associated with them. Uh, if you want to use hand labeling for your data, you need people to do that, and they that that can be sometimes hard to come by. It's very labor intensive. People aren't always consistent in their in their approaches. Um, we also run into issues with updating the the numerical models and having to retrain our our, our machine learning models on those. Uh, capturing sources of uncertainty, uh, like ch choices in there, like how you pre-process the data, can sometimes be a bigger have a bigger impact on your final performance than the actual choice of machine learning model, for instance. Uh, and there's finally the problem of tuning and maintaining more complex machine learning systems. So if we want the weather service to, to use, say, a bunch of deep learning systems, uh, the, the forecasters or an IT staff and uh, science support staff, are, well, they, they need training in how, how to do this and uh, financial support and and computational support to, to, to run this. Otherwise, uh, we make all these cool products that can't be used in operations. Uh, so some next steps to address some of these issues. One, uh, can we, how much can we uh, use transfer learning, the idea of training on one data set and then uh, providing additional data to refine the model? Uh, does this allow us to get over this retraining problem within WP? Uh, can we build our interactive visualization systems uh, to help to get more information out of the machine learning models into forecasters' hands to make better decisions? Can we add more physical constraints or uncertainty quantification to help increase the trustworthiness in our methods? Uh, and can we bring in societal data and meteorological data to make better decisions? So on that one, uh, we're we're currently working on an active project between Sizzle, RAL, and Mcubed on we call it convergent risk intelligence for severe impacts to society or crisis. Uh, the idea behind this is we, we're building a kind of a meteorological system to first estimate probability of tornadoes, and then downscale those to individual tornado tracks that we can uh, sample in a kind of Monte Carlo sense, and merge that with high, really high resolution population data and building data to get an integrated estimate of tornado risk uh, for, for different events. Uh, so we want to quantify uncertainty and, and, and see understand the sensitivities of this kind of system and see if there's ways we can use this to help decision makers better like prepare for uh, a, a severe weather event and allocate resources appropriately. Um, so with that, uh, happy to take some take take a couple questions.
Thank you very much, David John. That's an excellent talk. We do have one question and probably one time for one question in the chat uh, by Aaron Doherty. It says, how do you treat storms that change mode during their lifetime in regards to how they are classified? So, uh, Aaron, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, currently, we're, we're diagnosing the storm mode based off of a single time slice. Uh, the, for the hand labeling, the forecasters can, or the labelers can look at the previous and the next hour, but for our, the machine learning model just sees the current hour. So, so it can uh, see how, like, evolve with time. We've done some tests with temporal consistency in the mode, and the supervised method seems to do better than the semi-supervised method. Uh, we're definitely interested in ways to to help improve that. Um, OK, thanks. Uh, we'll have to move on uh, to our next talk. Um, it's uh, Extracting Information from Radar to Aid Data Assimilation by Ethan Gutman, who's a hydrometeorologist in Research Applications Lab. All right, thanks. Can you all see this? Yes. Thanks. Um, so this is a, another approach to using machine learning in uh, hazardous weather forecasting. This is work we've been work I've been doing with Dan Meganhart primarily, but had some really good conversations with David John a, a few years ago that set up a lot of this. And so definitely want to give credit to him for that. And I'll follow on. I'll, I'll see if I can remember to tie back to a number of the comments he made regarding pre-processing and things like that. It's, it's, it had a big impact. Um, so we're trying to find other ways to use machine learning to extract information from radar data with the idea of using that to improve data simulation and then allow the physical models to progress forward to make the actual forecast. Um, and some of the motivation for this is just that looking at the, the physical model, so a wharf forecast and the error in that forecast as a function of lead time, which really goes up in the first couple hours as the even though it has assimilated radar data, it really wasn't able to simulate all of the dynamics perfectly in the system. And so after that first hour, it really kind of drifts off um, until it so almost is reverting to more of a climatology, which has less error in a sense, or really you're seeing big storms, but you're not getting the, the tiny storms in the wrong place, um, or it's not consistently in the wrong place. And so we wanted to see if we could improve the dynamical information that we're giving the model in the assimilation step. Um, and part of this came from the idea that when you look at radar data, you see on the left here, and say maximum vertical velocities predicted by WARF, um, you see a fairly strong correspondence. Clearly the, the strong updrafts are closely related to where you're getting heavy precipitation events. But it's also not exactly a one-to-one. -one. It's not that we can just run a linear regression model on reflectivity and use that to compute max uh, vertical velocity. Um, indeed, if you were to just do that as a scatter plot, it looks sort of silly, right? Clearly, there is some vague relationship here, but it's pretty much a, an R squared of zero. Um, and we felt like we could do better because there's information in the spatial pattern in the radar data that's not present there. And very often, the, this indirect linkage is illustrated by just this sort of small spatial offset where the contours here are the vertical updrafts and then the shaded colors is model reflectivity. You can see often that there's a clear linkage between where you have strong updrafts and where you have reflectivity, but there are these spatial offsets either horizontally or, there, oops, sorry, I just took a second to build or vertically in where you're getting the, the hydrometeors, what the, the radar can see, and where you're getting the vertical updrafts that we need to be able to put into a model like WARF. Um, and so after some discussions with David John, we focused on this UNET approach. This is a, a deep learning architecture and it's, it's sort of a series of neural networks. So you can think of as just encoding different levels of information as you go down here, where the first step you're running a convolutional filter over the radar reflectivity and maybe you're finding edges basically in the magnitude of edges, orientation of edges. And the next one, you're starting to put those edges together into lines, and maybe you can determine if they're concave or convex. And then the next level of filtering, you're starting to connect lines together into shapes that might have some meaning. And then as you start to finally put together shapes and understand information about that, at this level, you're, you're kind of in the storm classification realm. 
And then we're kind of working back up. So if we know the storm classification, how can we feed that information combined with the location of shapes, combined with the location of edges um, to get actual predictions of vertical velocity. So we feed into this machine learning method, basically just labeled data from WARF. We, we take WARF as truth, which you know it's not, but it gives us a good proxy. And this connects with uh, David John's comment on transfer learning. The idea is here is to train the model on WARF as input, treating WARF as truth, but then be able to apply it to say radar data observations to predict vertical velocities that we can then feed into WARF. And fortunately, we do have some large training data sets. We heard earlier this morning from uh, Andres Prine in particular talking about the WARF CONUS data set. That's what we've been training on so far. Um, so this is a, a four kilometer WARF simulation over about a 13 year time period that covers a good portion of North America. And really we're just training on a, a small domain to get away from topography to begin with. We are now starting to move up to the CONUS 404 data set, which has 40 years of data. So much larger data set for the training. Um, and we've made sure to make sure that the, the physics in CONUS 404 are identical to the physics packages we're gonna be using in some more nature runs to test this as an, in a NASI framework. And the, the initial CONUS based um, results from this deep learning method are starting to look pretty good. So here we're predicting um, using, looking at composite reflectivity and then sort of a composite, basically a maximum vertical updraft from WARF in the center here and the machine learning predictions for the vertical updraft on the right here. Um, and I should note that we're, we're not trying to train the model in these gray areas. This is just sort of coming out as an artifact of the model. So you can mask out a lot of these areas. Probably the only place we'd want to actually try to assimilate these data are over the darker red spots where we have these strong vertical updrafts. And those areas really connect pretty well to what we're seeing here. And while there's a, a relationship to where there's just strong reflectivity, it's not exactly one-to-one. -one. Um, and should note that in this particular image, you get a correlation of about R squared of about 0.3 um, and across the entire test data set that was, so this was left out of any sort of training, you have an R squared of 0.26. So not perfect by any means, but hopefully this is providing more information to the assimilation and if given appropriate error characteristics, we'll improve our forecasts. Um, and we've tested out a few different pieces when we've tried using different time offsets in the radar data to train the model. Um, and it gives different results. It, it hasn't been clear that we're getting significantly better results. Initially, we thought with a, a five minute delay. So we start looking at the, the radar data sort of five minutes after the W labeled data under the assumption that it was the vertical velocities five minutes ago that are determining the radar reflectivity now. Um, and it turns out right now, we're not actually getting better predictions with that, but that's the, the kind of things we have to think about in this. Um, so right now the, the deep learning approach is giving us an R squared on the order of 0.25. Um, as I said, somewhat surprisingly, perhaps the no time offset seems to be doing the best. Um, and I didn't talk about it, but we've been training on sort of composite vertical velocities to maximum updraft. Um, we've also tried training to produce, reproduce individual model levels, and that doesn't seem to work very well, at least not yet. Um, in addition to that, you, you heard people talk about random forests earlier. We've tried a, a shallower learning approach that is kind of akin to a random forest. It's, it's actually somewhat simpler in that we're just searching for spatial analogs the idea is that the, if we just take a very small patch size and look for the pattern of reflectivity in an input data set versus a predicted data set, uh, a, a data set we're trying to predict and find similar patterns, um, we should be able to use those as analog time steps to look back at the, the work data and select the vertical velocities. Um, and I'm just gonna skip over this in the interest of time because this is where that methodology is at now. Um, when we scan through something like, oh, I forget it was a, a few hundred million possible patches to select because we're, we're looking across the domain at different possible subsets from each individual scene. 
um, and collect, say, the 10 best analog members and then average them together, you can see the predicted vertical updraft field on the, in the center here as compared to the true vertical updraft field from WARF. Um, a, a nice side effect of this is that because we have a, a collection of analogs, we can also look at the variance within them to get some sense of the error characteristics that could be used in the data assimilation step. Um, we can also reconstruct the, the reflectivity pattern and look at the differences between that and the true reflectivity that it was trying to match to give us some idea of what the error characteristics might be. Um, and we're, we're not getting as good a fit so far, at least, as we do with the deep learning method, where here we might have a, an R squared of more like 0.05. Um, so there's certainly information there. There are some nice features in that it's a little bit smoother of a field. We don't tend to get really weird artifacts the way we can with the, the deep learning network. Um, and when you zoom in on the, the predicted vertical velocity field versus the WARF truth vertical velocity field, you can see a lot of spatial features here that are coherent and, and make sense where you get these roles that are simulated in the, uh, the, the analog scheme as well. So the, the sort of fine spatial patterns within this larger um, pattern of vertical updrafts. Um, we get this stronger vertical updraft maximum here. Um, we got a lot of the edges that kind of make sense and it's sort of intuitively pleasing. Um, whether or not this will actually improve a forecast is still a, an open question. Um, in addition to the, the spatial patterns in horizontal, we can look at vertical cross sections through thunderstorms and see that this analog process is also generating the sort of realistic vertical structures of motion compared to the wharf truth on this particular day. Um, you also see some artifacts in the wharf model itself that are probably just numerical artifacts. When anytime I see this kind of ringing stepwise up, down, up, down, to me that says that this may be a numerical artifact rather than anything else. Um, and instead of looking at the average across a collection of analogs, we can look at individual analog members from this. Um, and here we start to get more sort of artifacts within this because we're, we're piecing together different analogs. Um, but you also, because you're not averaging across um, a collection, you get stronger maximum vertical velocities. Uh, the, the fit of this data set is better but it may well be that the statistics of individual analog members are actually better for an assimilation because you're able to then push the model in to, to reproduce stronger updrafts. Um, and again, the, the analog spread is available to help inform the, uh, the, the sort of assimilation cycle. Finally, we, we've taken these methods and particularly the deep learning method and now applied it to a, a nature run wharf simulation of a forecast of a, a major flooding event that occurred in West Virginia in June of 2020, uh, 2016. Um, this had so just really crazy accumulations of 250 millimeters in 24 hours in individual locations. Um, the, the wharf nature run is fairly realistic. It, you know, of course, it's not exactly the same thing, but it gives us realistic data set to, to test this out. And then we can use the machine learning model to predict vertical velocities that can be fed into a, a fine cast assimilation system to see how it affects forecasts. Um, and when you just look at the, the wharf true W field versus the wharf reflectivity, and then we switch to the, if we switch, come on, I'm running out of time, switch. So, there we go. So as soon as I hit that forward again, it's gonna jump. Um, you can see that the model predicted vertical velocities, particularly around those really strong updrafts. Um, oh, come on, keep going. Now I don't know where it thinks it is there. You can see it's putting them in the right places. Um, and so we're hopeful that this will help improve the actual simulation and forecasting when we treat this as this nature run as truth. Um, and so, sorry, I should mention, this is done with the, the deep learning network that Dan Megenhart put together. Um, 
And we can also now test this. This is again, taking this trends for learning approach to say, okay, we think we have a model that's been well-trained with WARF. What happens if we apply it directly to radar data from this time? Um, so this is the, the real radar data from NSL. Um, it obviously is not exactly the same as the radar data in WARF because WARF is just a nature run. It's uh, chaotic variability means it won't match perfectly. Um, but you can see that it's it's nice just to see that the machine learning model doesn't break. It doesn't produce anything crazy. Um, it's able to realistically interpret real radar data into potential vertical updraft fields as well here. So still something we're working on, but we're hoping that this will help with some of the forecasting. Going forward, we're gonna push this through thinking about other input data sets. Maybe we can use time series of outgoing long wave from satellites. Um, maybe we can just use time series of radar reflectivity to get more information. And we'll push a lot of these through various uh, observing system simulation experiments to see the impact they have on actual forecasts all the way down to stream flow. This graph came from Arazu as she's starting to run this exact data set through the national water model. Thank you. I don't know if we have any time. I haven't really been keeping track as well as I should have, sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Ethan. That was a very great talk and we actually have uh, quite a bit of time for questions, up to four minutes. So uh, anyone have any questions? Uh, we have one from Morris Weissman. Hi, very, very nice presentation. I was thinking that what you're doing is quite similar to the approach taken by the HER folks. I think they're still using their diabetic initialization procedure. And instead of trying to deduce updrafts from the reflectivity, um, they institute diabetic heating at the location of the reflectivity um, and then um, let the model go from that point. Um, have you compared your results to um, their process? No, that is one of the next steps I'd like to do as well is to try compare it. Once we can start doing this to specific events, start comparing to the HER forecast because we know it does some relatively sophisticated things from a purely physical basis to assimilate radar data. And so I'll be very curious to see how the two compare. Thank you. Really simple question, and I might have missed it. Um, with the analogs, did you uh, can you take a weighting approach, weighting some analogs more than others? Yep, it's it's not implemented, but it would be a couple of lines of code change where you just say weight, weight this analog more because it has a better fit. Uh -huh. um, it's the the biggest problem with the analog log method is because it's not building a, a random forest tree. It's trying to go back to the original data is just the sheer volumes of data necessary. Um, and so it's it's actually coded up in Fortran and parallelized across thousands of processors seems to work reasonably well. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of cool things like that you can apply where you, you start weighting different members more or less, for example. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? If not, we can uh, move on to our final presentation of this uh, session. And that is by Ryan Sobash of MCubed. And he'll speak about recent progress on using machine learning to produce short-term predictions of tornadoes and other convective hazards. Okay, great. So you should be able to see that slide and hear me. Um, yes. So, so yeah, great. This is... Uh, something we've been working on for a few years. Uh, and it's really originated in 2019 um, when we were running uh, the NCAR ensemble during the spring still at that point. And one of the things that I wanted to do was just to you know, see how well machine learning could determine which storms in our forecast would be severe. Um, so obviously that's something of interest to forecasters and we were using Updraft helicity for a long time is sort of our best diagnostic to pick out the most intense convection in a, say, a 36 hour forecast. Um, you can use thresholds to then kind of produce severe weather hazard probabilities from that. And I felt like that ran its course. And we kind of milked as much, of, much as we could out of that technique. And we, we had evidence that the forecast using that technique wasn't um, skillful in a lot of environments, particularly environments that were conducive to supercells. 
So, so we need something else to really extract that information about the hazards. Obviously, the, the convection allowing models or CAMs we're using are directly predicting those hazards. So we, I tested a, a random forest basically, and it just took out storm reports, or used storm reports for training, identified storms in the NCAR ensemble output, and then just trained which storms in the forecast would be severe. And, and so that's the, that's the image on the left. And that's sort of evolved over the last two years to become um, a gridded product using different types of data sets. Um, in the spring of 2020, we started this uh, project where we, we ran a bunch of forecasts where we previously run a bunch of three kilometer deterministic forecasts for another project. And I thought it would be good to use that large collection of forecasts as a training data set for machine learning. So we applied a couple different techniques, tested some of that in the, in the um, hazardous weather test bed in Norman, got some feedback. And, and the latest iteration of this is actually using operational convection LA models, so the HER, and doing this more frequently throughout the day, providing um, 0 and 12Z forecasts. And so I'll talk a little bit about the skill of these types of forecasts, um, what it may mean for the predictability of different hazards, and sort of where we're going in the future. So what we've been using primarily is a, just a very simple neural network the last couple of years. And uh, this is sort of how the system works. We have CAM input, three kilometer uh, gridded diagnostics and output fields from convection allowing models. And we upscale that to an 80 kilometer grid. That's primarily to um, provide forecasts of similar scales to the storm prediction center, as well as um, considering the storm reports we're using are probably, you know, don't have the fine scale information that we need to train with if we wanted to produce finer scale predictions. So we have some set of predictors uh, we've been using that are related to the likelihood for severe weather hazards. We input those, the neural network learns those relationships and outputs probabilities of different storm report types. So we're producing predictions of uh, tornadoes, hail events, intense wind gusts, um, uh, hail of different sizes, wind gusts of different thresholds, or just the, the probability that any type of severe weather hazard will occur. And this is just, a, which I've shown in several presentations in the past couple of years, is just visually how these, these forecasts look. This is, um, this is actually from one of our early uh, forecasts from a few years ago. Uh, the shaded regions are the reflectivity output by the model. And the probabilities are the um, probability in this case of a severe wind gust within some spatial and temporal window of the grid points. So this is 120 kilometer spatial windows. We've primarily been using 40 kilometers in two hours. That's sort of what we settled on in terms of providing predictions for different types of convective hazards. And we've done a lot of verification over the past couple of years uh, with both the forecasts, the neural networks that were trained with our deterministic model data sets that we have um, at NCAR and have evaluated a lot over the last few years. And you know, a few things fall out. One is these, these predictions are fairly reliable, even though they're trained with deterministic forecast data. They, they are tend to be more reliable and produce uh, more skill than uh, some of our baseline forecasts. And so we're using updraft helicity as a baseline forecast because we know that's worked pretty well uh, in the past as a predictor for where severe weather will occur. But we see improvements in the discrimination. We see it, the, the machine learning techniques identifying areas where severe weather will occur that updraft helicity doesn't. So it's, it's achieving that goal of producing better predictions in those environments that some of our diagnostics like updraft helicity don't do well in. And, and we also see evidence where there's flow dependence. So uh, how we were using updraft helicity, for example, we just smooth that with some smoothing length scale that had been tuned based on uh, verification statistics. And with the machine learning, we see that the, the probabilities aren't necessarily smoothed isotropically in space. We have um, regions that sort of can follow the areas where there's say instability or if there's boundaries such as cold fronts and dry lines. Um, it's sort of learned to not smooth or not spread that information into those environments where severe weather won't occur. So the last year we focused a lot of efforts on trying to use the operational data sets and we've run into some challenges. One is the operational data sets change somewhat frequently. This has come up a couple of times in the session. 
Uh, here's an example of this. We um, wanted to start using the operational HER and it went through a version change at the end of 2020. And one of the changes produced much larger updraft speeds uh, within the storms. And so here's some QQ plots that show the distributions between the two different model versions. Um, in, the, in the bottom left there, you can see that after about 20, above 20 meters per second in the, in the V3 version of the model, um, the, the difference in the climatology is, is pretty striking. Uh, the, a 30 meter per second updraft in, in version three of the HER occurs about as frequently as a 50 meter per second updraft in version four. I mean, that affects a variety of other fields, updraft helicity, a lot of the storm related pro properties that we're extracting from the, the CAMs um, have changed with this model version. So we had to get our hands on training data that was generated with uh, the, the model that became operational. So we contacted the GSL across town here and they gave us sort of an in-house training data set of a year of forecasts. And we've been applying those uh, to, uh, to train our neural networks over the last year. And here's just an example of what that could do to the forecast. It basically breaks the trained models. On the left, you have probabilities for a tornado uh, with training V3 applied to V4. You get probabilities that are completely out of bounds um, of what we would expect the probabilities to be. We'd like to see these probabilities in the range of the Storm Prediction Center probabilities so it can be um, you know, useful guidance and, and their forecasts are pretty well calibrated. So we trained with the new data set and, and, that, and that improved the, uh, this issue. So just to look at some skill scores here, this is from this past year, 2021, last year, over about 250 forecasts. As a function of forecast hour here, this is the Briar skill score. So anything above zero is better than climatology. I'm looking at the, the plotted here, the zero Z and the 12 Z forecasts. So we see sort of behavior that we've seen in other convection allowing model data sets. Uh, in terms of forecast skill, we see this diurnal cycle of skill. This is the skill of these forecasts at anticipating where any severe weather report will occur. It doesn't matter what type. We're not discriminating among the hazards here. So we see the diurnal cycle where the overnight predictions are just not as skillful. That could be just because they're more rare. There's only about 10% of the reports occur, um, say between six and 12 UTC compared to mid-afternoon. Um, and it could be that some of the systems that develop during the day, it's, it's a challenging forecasting problem to anticipate how they will um, evolve overnight and if they'll remain severe or not. So I think that's the combination of those issues in terms of why skill decreases overnight. And we see the 12Z forecast here providing um, a, a little bit of boost in skill, um, especially during the overnight or during the afternoon of the first diurnal cycle. And then that extends into the second diurnal cycle as well. So this is interesting because we trained our models just on zero Z forecasts. We've actually applied it to 12 Z forecasts. So this was a test just to see if we can get away with just applying, uh, just training the models with zero Z forecasts. Um, we'd expect the relationships to be robust enough that they could be applied to different in forecast initializations. We do train with forecast hour, which I thought could be problematic because um, obviously forecast hour is changing with the initializations, but that doesn't seem to have a huge impact. Uh, we still see that the 12Z forecasts are more skillful than the 0Z forecasts. Uh, this past spring, we took these forecasts to the HWT and compared them against a few different other systems. Um, some which were trained with ensemble information from uh, CAM ensembles, some which were trained with convection permitting or um, convection parameterized ensembles uh, like the GEFs. And so, uh, what I thought was the most interesting finding is that our forecasts, just trained with deterministic uh, HER forecast, subjectively scored somewhat similarly to some of these other techniques that are using ensemble information as their input. It's at least in the ballpark. For the, for the wind forecast, subjectively, they were, our forecasts were rated the highest days one and two, um, and it was in the ballpark for, for the hail forecast as well. So uh, moving forward, and I'll sort of conclude over the last few slides with where we're headed and sort of a vision for some of this work. Um, you know, we need this, so we can try to adapt the system to produce hourly updating uh, probabilistic convective hazard forecasts. A lot of the hazards that uh, we're predicting have short uh, forecast um, timescales or short predictability timescales where you really need you know, maybe data assimilation to 
uh, simulate radar information to initialize storms in the right place and time. And then you can get maybe an accurate prediction of the hazards. There's uncertainty in convection initiation in a lot of places or a lot of times. So where I see this going is, is trying to provide these types of machine learning products for a variety of different hazards and a variety of different initialization times. Um, other folks are kind of headed in this direction too, especially say the Warn on Forecast group and Norman who's producing um, these types of convection allowing ensembles very frequently and they're trying to integrate some of these machine learning techniques into the output of that system. So we've started to do this, just looking at a, a few cases over the last few months to see how do the forecasts um, sort of evolve as you get closer to the event, as well as trying to use a single training or trained model. So I'm still gonna use this model that we've trained with just zero Z her initializations and just try to apply it straight out of the box to different types of initializations. So if we look at the scale of some of these forecasts at different initialization times, this is the same plot as before, um, same type of verification strategy for, now I've overlaid the 18Z and the 21Z for her forecast. And so there's, um, there's certainly, you can see this boost of skill in this area here in the afternoon, which is the benefit of the data assimilation um, that's going into the forecasts, producing better initial states and, and where convection will occur. Um, so you, you see the largest in, increase in skill in these forecasts in this area here. And actually that tends to drop off overnight by 6C. Um, the, actually all, all four of those forecast initializations collapse somewhat. And so the spread in the skill is, is, is pretty low here, but you get a nice benefit from some of these early forecasts from say forecast hours out to nine and 10 from the afternoon forecast in terms of forecast skill. So what do these forecasts look like uh, leading up to two big events that just occurred a few months ago, two prolific tornado outbreaks, um, and one across Kentucky, a long track supercell that went through Mayfield uh, most notably, and then actually a different mode, convective mode that happened across Nebraska and Iowa where there was a large um, sort of derecho type system that produced a, a huge number of, of, of tornadoes, uh, uh, many of them short-lived associated with mesovortices within this line and embedded supercells. Um, very intense winds associated with this system. And so here is some of the forecasts basically leading up to this event. This was the, the Kentucky event. So what I've shown here is just probabilities of uh, a tornado occurrence within the grid box. The maximum uh, value of the probabilities over a, a 12 hour period. And the circles are where tornadoes were observed to occur. So we have the zero Z forecast in the upper left. This was basically 24 hours before the first tornado was observed. And you can see these first three forecasts here, they're not great at anticipating, especially the zero Z forecast 24 hours before the sort of areas where tornadoes occur, some slightly higher probabilities across Kentucky and, and Tennessee. And, and, and it gets further refined as you get closer to the event. There's a big jump in sort of the nature of the probabilities, which is just reflective of maybe the underlying her forecast changing quite a bit between zero and 6C and then 12Z. And then once you get into the afternoon and initi initiation for this event occurred fairly late. Um, and so 15, the 18Z her and the 23Z her, nine and six and one hour before the, the first tornado reports, you can really see these probabilities being refined. For tornadoes here, we don't often see probabilities above 15 to 20%. It's in line with sort of the range of SPC forecast probabilities. And for, especially for the 18Z and 23Z forecast leading up to the event, and the, uh, the 23Z forecast really highlighted that corridor where the, the long traps supercell occurred and tracked across Western Kentucky. And some of the highest probabilities were actually uh, in the region um, near Mayfield um, around 3.30 UTC. This is the uh, convective event in Iowa with the derecho, similar types of plots, similar initialization times. And again, the message here is just that early on, you know, sort of a kind of a rough idea of maybe the area where tornadoes occur, and then it, it slowly gets refined as you lead into the event. And then say one hour before the event, you have a really great forecast of sort of the region where um, tornadoes were ultimately occurred for this event. So I'll conclude with, uh, a few other sort of just research items for this year that we've sort of prioritized. We're 
integrating lightning information into the system to predict non-severe thunderstorms. This is primarily funded by JTTI grants or trying to transition these, um, some of these products um, and, and provide products that are useful to forecasters. And there's just a, a whole plethora of types of questions in terms of how we can use the machine learning models, how we train them, can we provide time lagged information and can the machine learning model optimally blend how those and weight those different members? How do we summarize CAM ensembles, which we haven't really trained with uh, yet, but how do, we, how do we do that most effectively? We have this mode project that, that DJ talked about. Can we take some of that information and um, integrate it within the, the, the neural networks and, and will that improve some of our um, ha convective hazard forecasts? To help with some of these, answer some of these questions, we, we had to hire a postdoc. And so uh, we're gonna bring a postdoc on board um, in late May to explore some of these questions and uh, maybe expand some of our usage of, of novel machine learning techniques and apply some interpretable, um, explainable machine learning approaches to, to these types of forecasts. So thanks for your attention. I'll, uh, I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Ryan. That was a very uh, exciting talk about the applications and how much uh, they can bring to the forecast community. And I found it very striking, the, the fact that you showed uh, how much the model could be degraded by changing model configuration, which is a huge issue for transition operations. Um, we have some time for questions, so happy to take any. Uh, we do have one question on the chat by Sarah Tessendorf. Uh, really encouraging results, especially for those two big tornado events. Have you looked at the false alarms much? For example, if the probabilities are greater than 10 to 15%, is there always a tornado report or do you get those types of probabilities without tornadoes being observed much? Yeah, I can make a few comments there. Um, you know, I think it does depend on the type of event. You know when there's lots of large scale forcing, when the environment is, is conducive to tornadoes, these forecasts are gonna be pretty good. There's lots of tornadoes where the, I mean, the predictability is extremely low and they may be on the ground for minutes. And, you know, we're, we're training with those tornado reports, but I'm not expecting our <laughs> systems to try to anticipate a lot of those tornadoes. I think the big outbreaks, it's gonna, it's gonna do well in and um, provide useful guidance. Um, I think one of the challenges is a mode related challenge uh, as well. We have, I have seen some false alarms with, um, with squall lines in MCS type systems where the, the probabilities, especially in environments that are say high, have high STP, which is generally indicated or an indicator of high tornado potential when tornadoes don't occur. And so the mode matters. Um, and so maybe incorporating some of this mode information will improve the forecast in those situations. Sorry, we have another question from Austin Coleman, our uh, real fascinating talk. Uh, curious about how the hazard probabilities from those case studies compared to operational guidance on those days. Did the machine learning technique focus areas with most active weather quicker than the rest of the ensemble guidance? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I haven't dug in too much to you know, what some of the other guidance products were saying for these events. Um, you know, we could certainly compare these to just say, and we, we have been doing this a lot, compare it to a non-machine learning technique. So if we just use updraft helicity, which is you know, probably a pretty good predictor on its own in these events, what are we gaining from, from using the machine learning methods? Is it providing better information than just some of those techniques? Um, I think the, the benefit there, these are two different modes, two different environments. So, you know, what the best baseline to use is somewhat challenging. Uh, but, you know, we are beholden to the skill of the underlying forecast. If the HER forecast skill is, is better, if the CAM ensembles improve, um, then the machine learning methods will, will certainly provide um, improved forecasts as well. Okay, I don't see any other questions, but we do have time for one or two more, and if um, not, we could open it up to all the speakers um, if, if we have any other questions. We, uh, yes, Jenny. I see Jenny has her hand raised. Uh, regarding the sensitivity um, to uh, the model versions, 
Well, I didn't think it from V3 to V4 could make a such big difference. But my question is, is there any simpler way to correct, uh, you know, like uh, correct the, the difference? Or you can do uh, maybe uh, um, um, not all, all the way reaching maybe uh, shallower uh, layers or not the deeper, uh, not, you can't remain, re, re, retain the uh, shallower layer, but return the deeper layer or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's 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 the whole idea behind transfer learning. So mm -hmm. we run into this problem with uh, you know, the convective mode project where we've trained a lot with our local and car wharf data sets and we're trying to mm -hmm. apply it to different models. And you know, the HREF right now is composed of very different looking forecasts. So, um, you know, some of this, some of the projects we're just trying to put together best practices on how you might reach, how you might train these things to get the best performance and leave it up to other folks to, as model configurations change to have to retrain. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, hopefully we can sort of explore the transfer learning space and see if we can extract out some information from say old versions that mm -hmm. can yeah. still be used. Um, the version three to version four change was particularly, I think, significant. Mm -hmm. uh, the change they made, uh, impacted the updraft speed properties and explicit fields quite a bit. So I think that's unusual in terms of the, the magnitude of that change. Usually there's smaller increments, but yeah. All right, well, we're at 2.15 PM now. So uh, we're going to transition into our next section of breakout discussions. But before we do that, I would just like to give a heartfelt thanks to all the speakers for a very exciting um, session. And hopefully it will spark conversations offline in collaboration. Uh, I think we can see from this session that there's a limitable, limitable angles at which we can apply machine learning to different geoscience problems. Uh, there's known strengths and weaknesses and unknown limits. And hopefully we'll start to crack at some of these questions in the breakout sec section. So. Uh, let me just bring up the uh, screen to remind ourselves of the two questions we will discuss. And right here uh, are the two topics at the bottom of this page. What are the new topics in hazardous high impact weather research that machine learning has poten potential application? And how can we further the applications of machine learning in hazardous or high impact weather research through cross cut collaboration? And so from there, I'll relinquish control over to uh, Jenny to break us out into our sessions. So yeah, Jenny, following on our discussion in the breakout session, I think it would be great to also include some air quality related stuff in, in stack. Air quality, uh, can you say again, include the- in, Including air quality related projects in stack. Uh-huh. Yeah. So you mean the, like some uh, self-funded project? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so um, um, currently, we don't have air quality as uh, one of our focus. But you know, in the future, it's we might uh, you know, like every few years, we make a new plan. Mm -hmm. So in the last plan, we still focus on the traditional hazards, uh, mainly related to the convection, deep convection. But uh, in the future, we may uh, expand. Uh, or change the topic, yeah. So 
Yeah, especially the coupled modeling that has been mentioned for a few times. Yeah, so we can have more discussion tomorrow on the coupled modeling. Yeah. Sounds, sounds good. Thank you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, I think uh, we are done for the day. So thank you all for staying uh, to the last minute and contribute to the discussion. So it's uh, in my group, I feel that the discussion went really well. Well, so people got a lot of good ideas. So thank you all. Then uh, tomorrow we will start um, uh, at 9, 9 a.m. So um, we'll have the third session on high impact weather uh, prediction. Okay, have a good rest of the afternoon. See you tomorrow.